Hi everyone. Welcome to session two of Addressing Educational Equity, our first online session. Very exciting. So today we are going to be talking more about race. It's going to be quite a theme throughout the class. I think that this is a really valuable moment for us to be engaging in these conversations about that while it's really important for us to be talking about a whole range of forms of oppression, if we're not able to talk about race, then we're not able to talk about oppression in general because we're gonna have to be avoiding this. Because for myself, as a white person, working in schools that are really white dominated, it's, I'm taught to not talk about race that much or that effectively. And so this class, we're going to be doing that. So I wanna give us some definitions so that we'll sort of be able to be on the same page. So the first definition of racism I wanted to give is that racism is racial prejudice plus power. So this definition is from the Aspen Institute on Community Change. And their definition of race itself is a specious classification of human beings created by Europeans, whites, which assigns human worth and social status using white as the model of humanity and the height of human achievement for the purpose of establishing and maintaining privilege and power. The idea of race is based on the ideas of white supremacy and white privilege. So in this, the purpose of race is a for a classification system that is designed to create hierarchy. There's a book called Stamped from the Beginning and a kid's version called Stamped by Ibram X. Kendi, who we're gonna be talking about more, that really looks at the history of racist ideas in the US and in the world and looks somewhat at this creation of race as a classification system. There's a lot of work that's been done on it. It, it becomes a classification system once the characteristics of mostly of skin color, um, sometimes not even fully that, get used to create um, valuations, right? Prejudice. A prejudice is a prejudgment in favor of or against a person, group, event, idea, or thing. An action based on prejudgment is discrimination. A negative prejudgment is often called a stereotype. An action based on a stereotype is called bigotry. Prejudice, you see there's no piece that power plays into that definition and it's not entirely about race, right? So this picture next to it is about phrenology, the way that people would use skull, quote unquote, information to make classifications and decisions. And that, that is super linked in to ways that race was created and ways that disabledism manifested and ways that sort of classification systems directly connected to power structure. So power is a relational term. This is all from Aspen Institute. It can only be understood as a relationship between human beings in a specific historical, economic, and social setting. It must be exercised to be visible. So how there's two, the interactions between any two people are really unique to that historical moment. I think about this in terms of big picture history, but also small picture history, right? So often, when we are a toddler, our parents are taking care of us. Often when our parents are aging and much older, we as adults are taking care of them. We're the same two people, but the power dynamics are different. That would be an interpersonal example that doesn't have to do as much with these larger structures. So power is also control of or access to those institutions sanctioned by the state. So the institutions of schools, for example, or military or policing or Congress or 
even things that are not of the state but sanctioned by the state, so business, religion, things like that. It's the ability to define reality and convince other people that it is their definition. So to own those structures of naming and to own those structures of what does and doesn't matter. It's ownership and control of the major resources of a state, whether those resources are physical resources or whether they are structural and the capacity to make and enforce decisions based on this ownership and control. So just having it, that's not what matters. What matters is that when you have it, then you get to do things that maintain that sort of, you, you get to have make policies, you get to make decisions that keep those dis, distinctions. It's the capacity of a group of people to decide what they want and to act in an organized way to get it. And for an individual, power is the capacity to act. So power can be something that is systematically kept from people and power can be something that is um, gotten without being earned and it can be something that changes, shifts over time. There's a lot of different ways that it plays out. But so those are all the parts of the first definition. Racism is racial prejudice plus power. It is about this categorization system and making judgments and discriminations around it when some by people and institutions and groups that have control, ownership, access, and the ability to define reality. So that's a definition of racism that we can use for this week. There's an alternative definition of racism by Ibram X. Kendi. That's who I mentioned about the stamped book. Um, this definition comes from his book, How to Be Anti an Anti-Racist. And his definition of something that's racist is something that produces or sustains racial inequity. So I want to break that down a little more too. So, so being racist is supporting a racist policy through actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea or a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequity. Does this work with that dictionary idea like you can't use the word to define the word? I mean, not exactly, but when you really break it down, it does, right? So a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. So. An example of a racist policy could be redlining. So I'm not gonna get deeply into it. If you haven't heard of redlining, I definitely recommend looking it up, but it's a situation, a policy and a set of ongoing decisions using power to ensure that black people were kept out of large portions of the housing market based on where people were allowed to live and how loans were made. So that's a racist policy that produced and sustained racial inequity. And then the way that the things that mortgage companies look for to show job, you know, to show that people are going to be able to afford their mortgage, the way that it looks to previous property ownership, the way it looks to people being able to co-sign for loans and leases that have a secured amount of family money, the way that, um, the way that down payments are sort of structured or expected in different ways in different places, the areas, that you're able to and not able to get FHA loans and other loans that people might qualify for, that not everyone would, those can be policies that sustain racial inequity because they already are working through a premise where black people have less access to 
well-paying jobs, have less access to family property to be sold and inherited that will possibly give more money for a balloon down payment all to people who would be able to co-sign for a previous lease for those same reasons who then don't have the rental history that show the security, right? I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm not saying that I necessarily have an anti-racist policy to suggest in replacement, but I think what's key is that there are policies that are explicitly and intentionally promoting and producing racial inequity, and then there are those that continue based on the premises that have already been set up of racial inequity in our society that can sustain it. And so by Kendi's definition, both of those are racist, right? So I wanted a longer quote from him. Racist policy also cuts to the core of racism better than racial discrimination, another common phrase. Racial discrimination is an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. When someone discriminates against a person in a racial group, they are carrying out a policy or taking advantage of the lack of a protective policy. We all have the power to discriminate. Only an exclusive few have the power to make policy. Focusing on racial discrimination takes our eyes off the central agents of racism. Racial, racist policy and racist policymakers, or what I call racist power. So I wanted to just share that because I think that it really gets at how his definition connects to the previous definition, which is that that power is a core piece of it, but that it's a different look at power, right? So in the first sort of definition, that it's whether people themselves have structural power based on their racial group. So this one looks at this broader picture also of power structures and how people choose to take advantage of those or not. So Kendi offers that there are three patterns of behavior that drive racial dynamics. So he names those segregationism, assimilationism, and anti-racism. And the first two, segregationism and assimilationism, both fall under racism. So segregationism, segregationists ask as if some groups are permanently inferior and support policy that segregates that group. So that's the really, that's the redlining side, right? Like that's the stuff where I think that most of us are like, no what and then assimilation is support cultural or behavioral enrichment programs to develop marginalized racial groups or don't see race so this assimilationist policies and assimilationist approaches are the ones that sort of sustain the racism that we already have in place because of segregationists right it's making race blind policies when there's already huge racial disparities, or it is boarding schools for Native Americans when they were designed to bring Native Americans to a more neutral, which means white in that case, right, sort of framework. And then anti-racist support policy that reduces racial inequity because of a belief that racial groups are equal. So those policies could be policies that really centralize race as a lever to reduce racial inequity. So that could be where we'd have uh, home ownership programs that are targeted towards black people because of the fact of a need to redress the drastic racist structures and policies that have made black home ownership so difficult and what that has done to shift the the wealth disparities with or to intensify the wealth disparities along racial lines within the US. So these definitions are pretty different and so I want to just think for a minute about what this definition offers and what it loses because I think that 
one risk of it. I am personally had been using the previous definition for years and years and years at probably about 20 years. And hearing this definition sort of blew my mind because it looks at power in a larger picture way. And when I first read it, it seems like it gives people an off the hook opportunity for their own racist interactions. But the longer you think, I think about it, the less I feel like that's true. But what I do feel like it loses is that we can't necessarily know the impact immediately of um, policies on racial inequity. And so I think that it can make make gauging actions a little harder, but possibly harder in a really valuable way. So there's a zillion different formats of this. And I just wanted to do one quick picture. This is from the Dismantling Racism Works web workbook. Um, so it's looking at personal, institutional, and cultural racism. You can also hear there's the eyes, which is individual, interpersonal, institutional, and ideological. There's the five bases of racism. There's a lot of different approaches, but at their core, all of them look at the fact that when we talk about racism, a lot of times we talk about just the individual acts. So this describes individual acts as how are individuals accountable to each other and to racial justice. I think um, Kendi would add, how do people make decisions to create and uphold policies that bring about racial equity and destroy and work against policies that breed racial inequity? Then there's the institutional, and that's where the policies come. That's where um, what Rich, what Kendi was saying about the systemic piece, it's all there, right? It, that's the air. And how are white people served, included, financially resourced, uplifted, validated? How are people of color excluded, underserved, financially exploited, oppressed, and invalidated? And then cultural, which is even outside of the institutional piece, and that's beliefs, values, and norms. And I think that a common approach to that is thinking that the cultural pieces shape the institutional pieces. But Kendi argues, if you choose to read his books or even just read some interviews with him, that the, that's a much less direct, uh, like much less directional relationship that also the institutional policies shape the cultural beliefs and values. And so this says, how do community beliefs values and norms validate whiteness and invalidate people and communities of color. And so I wanna say for the work that we're doing this class, we're gonna be looking at both parts, both this personal piece and the institutional piece because we are all working within state institutions of schools and we are all working within many, many, many institutions all the time and the policies that we respond to whether they're explicit or implicit, are, are coming at us constantly. And we have possibly minimal, possibly larger roles in those, but those roles are worth acknowledging also and figuring out how we can leverage. So I wanna talk a little about implicit bias and I feel like implicit bias is a buzzword and also sometimes we leave it there. So I want, to talk about it, we're gonna watch a brief video and then I wanna reflect back. So implicit bias is also known as implicit social cognition. It refers to the attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. They can be favorable, they can be unfavorable, but they are outside of our awareness or intentional control and they are involuntary. So they reside deep in the subconscious. They're different from known biases that we might still choose to conceal but these are not accessible through introspection. They're pervasive. Everyone possesses them, even people like judges who are supposed to be impartial. 
their implicit and explicit biases are related but distinct mental constructs. They are not mutually exclusive. They might reinforce each other. And they might actually be in conflict. Our implicit associations don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs. They don't necessarily reflect stances we would endorse. We tend to favor our own in-group with our biases, though not always, and especially the it's more likely not to if the in-group is one that is has been socially maligned, right? So LGBTQ slash T people have a higher likelihood to have implicit biases against LGBTQ slash T people than straight people do against straight people, and people of color have higher likelihoods to hold implicit biases against their own racial groups than white people do against their own racial groups. But they're malleable, right? So even if we don't know them, our brains are really complex and we can unlearn them once we start to understand them. So I wanna watch this video. You can either pause and click through here. You can use the link. It's in the course sites folder, but it's called Implicit Bias, How It Affects Us and How We Push Through by Melanie Funches. It is a TEDx talk, and I think that it gives us a good jumping off point. So come back when you're done. So what I like about this is that at the end, she talks about noticing not being enough, and then she offers us some steps. So do your own work. Call yourself on your own stuff, is what she says, and talk to your family and friends. Then make connections with people who don't look like you. So the ways that our culture is created is pretty segregated, especially around uh, questions of race. So do the work to desegregate your own life after you've already done some of your own work around recognizing racism and then use privilege to create equity, right? This isn't just stick with what you know. It's looking at these bigger definitions of racism. If racism is racial prejudice plus power, or if racism is policies that promote racial inequity that people then enforce, uphold, put into place, how can you use the privilege that you have? How can I use the privilege that I have to change those? How can we use that privilege as a lever? And then engaging in non-biasing activities. So continuing to do that work, working to actively unlearn. So I just want to have, I have a couple more slides that are images that I want to talk out with. So the first one is, when is it too young to talk about race? When are kids too young for that? And I wanted to put in this image because I know a lot of us work with kids who are older than six, but this is looking at all the way starting at zero. A lot of us also have other kids in our lives, parents as parents or otherwise. So at birth, babies look equally at faces of all races. At three months, babies look more at faces that match the race of their caregivers. Children as young as two use race to reason about people's behaviors. By 30 months, most children use race to choose playmates. Expression of racial prejudice often peak at ages four and five. By five, black and Latinx children in research settings show no preference toward their own group compared to whites, but white children remain strongly favored and biased in favor of whiteness. By kindergarten, children have so many of the same racial attitudes that adults in our culture hold, they've already learned to associate some groups with higher status than others. And explicit conversations with five to seven year olds about interracial friendship can dramatically improve their racial attitudes in as little as a single week. So having these conversations with kids starting really young can be really, really valuable. And there's some resources in the in the course sites about how to have those conversations. And I'd love if people want to share more. But I just want to put this in because I think sometimes when we're talking about race, we think about more talking about it in high school and maybe middle school. But it's important to start really young. And if a kid is in a vast majority white area, 
it is just as important, if not more important, to be talking about it. As whether it's a white kid in a majority white area or a child of color in a majority white area. But white children who are mostly surrounded by other white children need these conversations about race as well. And this is a five-year-old picture, but I wanted to sort of show it. So this is since slavery began in the US. The red portion is the slavery. The blue portion is segregation, obviously reconstruction and all that's in there. Um, and we've been hearing a lot more recently about how segregation was enforced, both the policies and the acts of terrorism that made that happen for 99 years. And not that segregation doesn't still exist, but in terms of structurally legalized and mandated segregation, it has only been not the law of the land for at this point 56 years. And we know that there are still a lot of racist policies, but when we're thinking about those two ways that racist policies can function to either produce or sustain racial inequity, we had, what, like 364 years where almost every policy was designed to produce racial inequity. So, it's really, it's easier than not to continue to create policies that sustain it. And that's where Kendi's idea of anti-racism really comes in, is that it's an active decision. So I want a reflection from you, and I'm gonna say this now. I will be reading the discussion board and reading all of these reflections but I won't necessarily be re responding to every reflection unless I explicitly am asked to do so. So let me know if you want a response to your reflection. Otherwise, I will be reading it. I will be thinking about it, but won't necessarily respond to each one. I think it can get overwhelming for students also to have to have a response to each thing because when do you decide when to respond back, right? But anytime you want one, let me know. So what I'd like you to reflect on is the policies that you have seen in schools, in your schools, either the ones you work in now or ones you've worked in before, and to try to think of at least one or two racist policies and one or two anti-racist policies. And for racist, you can use either Kendi's definition or the prejudice plus power definition. So thinking about what have you seen and if you have any thoughts on the impacts of them, that would be great. But I want either way, whatever definition you use to be thinking more about the structural pieces, the big picture, not a racist thing that someone said at one point, though if that's relevant to how the policies are upheld, then that's fine. But really thinking about large-scale policies and practice expectations. All right. Thank you so much. I hope that you appreciate some of the readings from this week. Thanks.